title of the message this afternoon is Submitting One to Another. Submitting One to Another. I've taken a break from the Revelation series. We actually, uh, I, the sermon I preached this morning in Iola, kind of dealt a little bit with that topic as well, and I've just been preaching so much uh, on that and studying so much. I just felt like I need to get a break. seems like every message I preach is just talking about coming tribulation and enduring and all that, which is great. It's a lot. There's a lot of that in the Bible, but I just want to take a little break and just uh, talk about some other things, both here and in Iola uh, right now, and then tonight's sermon will be uh, of a little bit different nature than the prophecy we've been dealing with. So turn to James 4. And we're talking about submitting one to another, as that phrase was used there in Ephesians 5. Brother Justin read that, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but you're turning to James 4, and let me read a couple passages to you. Romans 12.10 says, uh, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Now, it's not natural. It's not within our human nature to prefer somebody else over ourselves, right? It's not natural. Uh, we need help with that. We need this filling of the Spirit to help us to uh, have brotherly love and to prefer one another. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. It's not in our nature to serve one another. It's in our nature to want somebody to serve us and to please us and do something for us. But it says uh, that we should love and serve one another. Okay, 1 Peter 2, uh, 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. All right? That's certainly not natural <laughs> within us to want to honor our authorities and the uh, uh, the king, especially in those, and then uh, just and then it says just the brotherhood. Okay, First Peter three eight says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Okay, so we're supposed to show pity, we're supposed to show uh, courteousness to one another, and these are not natural things within us. And this is why we see over and over in the Bible, you know, Galatians 3 talks about a lot. These are the fruit of the Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We need the help, help of the Lord. And so we know this from the Bible that any strife and fighting and divisions that happens, and they're going to happen. There's just no doubt about it. If you're in a marriage relationship, at some point or another, you're going to fight. All right. I remember for years telling everybody, well, my wife and I, we don't ever fight. And that's kind of true. It's more like if she's mad at me, she just stopped talking. <laughs> but, you know, but eventually I, I couldn't say that anymore because I knew we had been in some fights. Now we love each other. Everything's fine. But but there's always strife. There's times of strife. There's times of tensions. There's times we get in the flesh. Hey, every church is going to have some divisions, some times where people bump heads. Uh, sometimes, you know, and this is why we over and over, we have to be reminded to forgive one another. We have to be reminded how to deal in those with each other in those situations. But what it comes down to anytime there's fighting or strife of some sort or division, you know, uh, it comes from, I, I would say almost every time it's going to come from some kind of selfishness and some kind of, uh, uh, just a pride within us. Okay. And James four, says it this way, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Now if we spend all of our time just trying to make ourselves happy, uh, and, and just please our own selves, then we are obviously not going to receive uh, the blessings of the Spirit to give us uh, to do His work and to be successful in, do, in, in functioning together as a church, in a marriage relationship, uh, parent-child relationship, anything. It's got to be uh, you know, something that's not within us, not us searching our own lusts and our own desires, but searching, hey, what is the Holy Spirit? got for me? What does he want me to do? And so I want to uh, preach about this idea of submitting one to another. Go back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 
And I'm sure I've preached uh, from this text before here. But when I, whenever I study this passage of Scripture, I always come to this place where it says, uh, I look at verse 21, where it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And I think, what does that mean, like submit yourselves one to another? Now, you could take that too far. You know, I, I've, I've heard people say, oh, that means nobody's the authority. You know, when you get into a church, hey, everybody just is to submit to everybody else and do whatever pleases everybody else. Well, not exactly. That's not exactly true. Uh, I think that if you read the context here, he's saying you need to submit into the position that you, you are, you know, submit to the authorities that are over you. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. But, uh, but we, and we know this too, that there are some people that we're supposed to be in subjection to, our government. I mean, can anybody deny that the Bible does say that we're supposed to you know, honor the government? We're supposed to obey those who have the, the, that authority over us. But look, we all know that there's a time where the government might ask us to do something that's contrary to the Word of God. We got to obey God rather than man. We understand that. But that doesn't take away our responsibility that is whenever we can, whenever it's possible, we should obey. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of these things. And the first point is, is quite obvious. Uh, you understand this, and, and uh, it, I don't have to spend very much time in it. But the first thing we see is that we are supposed to submit ourselves to God. Keep your place in Ephesians because we're coming back. But James 4 again, and I already lost my place there, so i got to go find it again. But James 4, we finished reading uh, in verse 3. So let's pick up with verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. I mean, that's not a name that I want to be called, right? But this is what he's saying. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is enemy with God is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Whereunto he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, Ye double-minded. Now, we understand we're supposed to submit to God. He's our final authority. We, we, the Bible, His Word is our final authority. And we're supposed to seek His will. What does He want? What's His desire for our life? Uh, we, don't, we, we understand that. That makes sense. But sometimes I think what we fail to see is that everybody that we submit to, if we're Christians trying to follow the will of God, we're actually submitting to Him whenever we do that. Okay, so back to Ephesians 5, <clears throat> he gives us kind of uh, some authorities in our life that we might have to submit to. All right, so we know we're supposed to submit to God. By submitting to God, I mean, in that we're submitting to God, we must also submit to the authorities that God has placed over us. Okay, let me use an illustration. Let's say... Uh, my kids are going to be left. This has happened multiple times. Okay, kids are going to be left at home. I mean, they're they're grown up now; they can do it. But the kids are going to be left at home for a little while. We're going to leave the house. I might say, as the dad, all right, Sharice, Zachary. I mean, Sharice, Braden. I get my kids' names mixed up all the time. Sharice, <laughs> Braden, Zachary's in charge. How many of you think that that went well every time I ever said that? No, it didn't go well because naturally they don't want to follow their older brother. They want, I don't know, maybe they want to, leave, they want to be the ruler or maybe they just don't, don't like uh, whatever the, he might tell them to do or they don't think that he's equipped and ready to do that. This is just an illustration, okay? But if I were to say that and then I left and I came back and Zachary said, you know what, I kept telling them they have to do this, they have to do that, and they never did it. I would probably be upset. But the main reason I'm upset is because by them disobeying him, they were disobeying me. Does that make sense? And so when God puts authorities in our life and we disobey them, we're really disobeying God. 
right? And the Bible's very, very clear about that. Over and over, it says, hey, you're obeying them. Hey, actually, if you've got a knucklehead boss at work that you're working for, and you just cannot stand this guy, and he's always, you know, just seems rude to you and ugly, he's a know-it-all, you can't stand him or whatever, that actually should bring some peace to your mind <laughs> to know, like, all right, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm obeying it for the Lord, <laughs> you know, because God's got him over me at this time in my life for a reason. And so I'm going to submit to God by submitting to his authority. Now, again, if God's our final authority, then if our boss tells us to do something ungodly, obviously we obey God rather than man. But he is, uh, at that time, he has got uh, some authority in our life. So, uh, so chapter 5, verse 22. Oh, Ephesians 5, 22. Here's what we say. It does say, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then it gives you some areas of submission. Okay, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, he addresses the husbands. They need to love their wives, as even as Christ loved the church. Okay, and then, uh, but in terms of authority, that husband is given the role of authority. Now, he has a job to do. He's, he needs to be responsible enough to love his wife and to favor her and to uh, uh, learn, dwell with her according to knowledge and figure out what uh, makes her happy and, and provide for her needs and all that. Yeah, that's part of his responsibility. But he has still got that uh, position as the authority of that home. Okay, and then chapter 6, verse 1, what's it say? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Notice how it says, in the Lord. <laughs> you're obeying your parents, and every time you obey your parents, you're obeying the Lord. Right Now you probably, all, all the kids in this room, I mean, no, love your parents, and so you want to obey them, you respect them and all that. But even if you didn't, you're obeying them because God put them over you in your life. You didn't have a choice. He put them in there. This is why I think uh, that in the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, you split the Ten Commandments in half. You've got the first half deal with our relationship to God, right? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind, all thy strength. And then the second, likened to the first, love thy neighbor as thyself. And the second five commandments deal with our relationship with mankind. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet, and so and on all these things. Well, you say, well, where is honor thy father and mother in that? Well, that is in the first, the first five commandments, right? That's the number five. And I believe that's for a purpose. I believe that by honoring your parents, you know, you're actually submitting yourself to God because you didn't have a choice. He put this, your, he gave you those parents and uh, gave you to those parents and you have to obey your parents. That's how you obey God, okay? And, uh, and so we see that. And then we see also about servants. Now, the, the closest thing we have is the employer-employee relationship that we have now in our society. But regardless of how harsh the masters are or whatever, uh, we have a place that says, verse five, there, uh, chapter 6, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sing singleness of your heart. What well, are the next words? As unto Christ. Over and over he makes it clear. By submitting to uh, those authorities in your life, you're submitting to God. Okay? Now, it, as far as, let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. As far as uh, the authority of a pastor goes, it's the same thing. Now, I don't have any say over a person's household. You know, I couldn't go into uh, Brother David's house and tell his family what to do. That's his responsibility. That's his authority. In fact, I'll get to this in a minute, but if I went to his house, I would submit myself to the rules of his house because I, that's not my house. That's his house. And so I would be in subjection to him. If he said, take your shoes off at the door, I'll be like, who are you? I'm the pastor. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm in his house. You see what I'm saying? And so, uh, and so, so at a church, as the pastor, now like I'm not on a power trip or anything like that, but as a pastor, it's my job to make sure that rules are enforced and that, that we do things a certain way. It might not be the way some people like it, or maybe I'm not 
you know, uh, strong enough in some areas or, you know, wise enough in some areas. Maybe I don't fulfill certain things that you would rather have as a pastor. And I'm not saying anybody in here feels like that. I'm just, I'm just going with the message here. It doesn't matter. Submit yourself to the authority because you're doing it unto the Lord, first of all. Second of all, you know, it's best for everybody. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give, an account, give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. You wouldn't want your pastor to constantly be coming in and being like, oh man, am I going to, you know, am I going to make somebody upset, ruffle feathers if I ask him to do this or that? And, and I say, hey, could you go do this for me? And they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, that's going to make it bad for you because it's going to be harder for me as their pastor to kind of ask you to do something. Uh, does that make sense? You know, so the whole idea is trying to avoid tension, trying to avoid, you know, areas of contention where it's just like, oh man, this is making it hard on everybody. And because again, where do those wars and those divisions and that fighting come from? Well, it's the lust of our flesh. It's the pride that's in us that says, hey, I want things my way. I don't want to submit myself to authority. Everything works so much smoother when we say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and prefer this person over me. Or I'm going to go ahead and submit myself to this authority, even if it's not exactly the way, you know, he's not asking to do things exactly the way that I want to do it. We want to be very careful to do this. Now, as far as the pastor of the church, and we, we don't have a whole lot of folks here, so this isn't going to be very super applicable uh, for everybody to hear. But this is, this is the way I feel, and I want to make sure it's clear. I've not... I've not ordained anybody. We don't have a need to necessarily at this point to have all these positions and titles and all this kind of stuff because we're real, still very small. So I've not officially ordained anybody to a position. Now, I have named in the past certain people and put them over certain areas where just for delegation's sake, makes it a little easier if I'm gone or somebody else is heading something up. And I've picked people that I know will come to me if there's a problem or there's contention or there's something that's not happening right. And I know that they'll ask me, hey, what should I do about this situation or whatever? And so I feel very comfortable to hand it over to them in that spot. Again, not ordained or made any kind of a title or something like that. But I think everybody knows who, you know, the go to people are for certain events or certain areas of the church. And so here's the thing, you know, I might have delegated some jobs to them. And you might think, man, that's not the way that I want to do it. You know, I, I, just, I think I've got a better idea than they do. <laughs> I think I'm more knowledgeable than they are. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's going to be best for everybody if you just submit yourself to, to the authorities. I remember whenever I was working at UPS, and here I was, a punk kid. 18 years old, I think, was whenever I was able to start working out there. And I think by the time I was 19, uh, I became a supervisor. And here's a, I've only been working there for a year. Now, granted, I've been working hard, busting my tail, learning how to do everything. And, and, uh, and so I cl wanted to climb the ladder because that's what you're supposed to do. So I wanted to be a supervisor. I wanted to be able to uh, actually, you know, you got an increase in pay for one thing. <laughs> then you just felt like, hey, I'm climbing the ladder. I'm doing good. So they put me in a position to basically oversee, I think it was like 12 trailers that we had on each belt. So 12 trailers, probably average one person per trailer. So all these people, I got to make sure they're busy all night and they're doing the job. But here I am a 19 year old kid and I've got 20 year olds, 30, 40 year olds, <laughs> you know, and they're in there. And I remember that feeling of just like, how can I tell these people what to do? They're going to look at me like, you know how long I've been doing this job <laughs> and you've only been here one year and you're going to, and I'm telling you, that was a really hard thing. I had to work really hard at establishing a relationship with those guys and proving myself and letting them know that, Hey, I'm on your side. I'm trying to help you. I'm not your enemy because it was a, it was a teamster, you know, the unions, 
don't get me started on unions. <laughs> but anyway, it was hard to develop that management and, uh, uh, you know, teamster relationship. But I had to try to convince them. I remember how difficult that is. And, you know, man, everything would just work so smoothly if people just like, well, you're the boss. What do you want to do? And then I would say, hey, let's do it this way. And they would say, uh, you sure you want to do that? Because we tried that before and it didn't work very well. Oh, really? What? You know, you, you, there's a way to even say, hey, I don't agree with you. I don't think that's a good idea without just this big contention. Nine times out of ten, it didn't work that way. Nine times out of ten, it was like, Psh, I'm not going to do it that way. You can do it that way if you want to. I mean, it was just, uh, and I'd go to work stressed out every night and the whole belt could, uh, could sense that and they could all feel it. And we would go under every night. What I mean by going under is, is those belts start backing up and you got boxes falling from the sky and you got <laughs> trailers just falling apart. And I mean, it was stressful, stressful, stressful. And that's, that's just the world that we live in. Every workforce is like that. You're going to have stress. They're going to push you to your limits where you, you know, uh, you're just about to break and then they'll, they'll ease up on you a little bit. They want to get as much work out of you as they can. I would say though, for the church of God, it shouldn't be like that. We of all people should be able to say, hey, well, we're just going to submit ourselves. We're going to get the job done. No tension, no fighting, no strife, no divisions among us. We're going to be selfless and we're going to uh, uh, prefer one another and be gracious and pitiful and courteous and all those things the Bible says us to do. Well, let's be honest, we're all human. We all have got the flesh and the pride of life that swells up inside us. And sometimes these things are still going to come, okay? So we know that we have to submit ourselves to God. We know we have to submit ourselves to the authorities that God has put in our life. Here's the hard part. I believe we also, it's also right to submit to somebody, sometimes to submit to people who aren't our authority, right? Now, I, when it says submit yourselves one to another, I don't think that just means, hey, just do whatever anybody tells you to do. That's not the idea, okay? But I think that we have to understand this mindset that we have got to submit ourselves to other people, even though they aren't our authority, you know? And like I said, if I went to Brother Stevie's house, I would be subject to his rules, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean, hey, I don't, I don't subject myself to uh, somebody else's rules. If I, um, if I go, if I go door knocking with one of you guys, I don't matter. It doesn't matter who it is. I could go door knocking with uh, Isaac here, and if I, it's Isaac's turn to get up and to knock on the door and talk, guess what? I'm going to submit to him. You say, well, you're his pastor. You shouldn't submit to him. Yeah, I, do, I think that that would be good to submit to him. He said, hey, will you give me one of those tracks? I'm like, who are you? <laughs> I'm the pastor. You don't ask me those kind of things. That would be ridiculous, right? Sure, what do you need? You know? And he says, hey, can you look up this verse for me? I'm going to be like looking it up for him. I'm submitting to him. That should be the attitude that we have. Nobody's better than somebody else, right? We just have different places of authority, you know, in our life right now. But so, so I think that we need to just be always willing. Hey, it's not like, well, who do I get to lead? You know, or who am I over? Or anything like that. Just always be willing to submit. And we, things work so much better whenever we do that. So when we're at somebody's house, we should be submissive to their rules, right? Look at 1 Corinthians 10. I, I'm going to preach a message from this text sometime specifically. This has come up a few times. Where am I? 1 Corinthians 10. And look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things uh, edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in shambles, that has to do with like the meat market where you buy meat. Okay, what's sold in shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, 
and ye, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I, uh, for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat, and this is key, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Okay, so here's what he said. When I am, because I've heard people take this verse, the kind of the dispensational view is like, see right there, there's divisions. You've got, you've got the uh, Jews and the Gentiles and the church of God. And they've separated those three as like distinct groups and use that kind of for some of their dispensationalist views. But really, you got to think about the time that he was living in. Okay, the time that he's living in, there are times when he's in a crowd that is a Jewish crowd. They say, hey, your job's not just to go in there and offend these guys, right? And to just cause them to stumble. And hey, they're, uh, Yes, they're Jews, but you're doing all things to the glory of God. Your desire is to reach them. Your desire is to edify. Your desire is to, to build up, to do the work of God when you're around these people. Not to cause offense, right? How about when you're with the Gentiles? Okay, walking about there, the Gentiles. Hey, it was a big deal for, uh, for the Jews at that day to not be seen with Gentiles and not to be intermingling with them. They were dogs, right? And so it wasn't really that great to be with them. But Paul was saying, hey, don't give offense to the Gentiles. Yeah, Paul, was when he was with Gentiles, he didn't act like, don't you know, I'm... Uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews, <laughs> you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a Pharisee. No, he wasn't anymore. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. He didn't care, you know, what their social status was or anything like that. He didn't want to give offense to them. Now, by offense, that doesn't mean, hey, don't ever, you know, just try your, you know, everything, never, never to offend anybody, because we know people are going to be offended when we preach the Word of God, but not deliberately going and just being, uh, uh, you know, offensive to somebody and causing uh, harm. You're trying to do the work of God. You're wanting to bring glory uh, to God in the situation, okay? So you're submitting yourself to, to God's will, okay? Neither to Jews nor to the church of God, okay? So when you're in the church and you're with brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, that's not the time either to go and offending them and, and uh, causing them to stumble, okay? Even as I please all men in all things. Now, how many of you guys think Paul, the Apostle Paul pleased all men at all times? Just, hey, I won't say anything to offend you. I'm just trying to please you. And, uh, no, of course not. We know Paul better than that. A lot of people got mad at Paul for what things that he said. So this is the idea that we just never say anything that makes somebody mad or whatever. But the idea is that we're careful about how we do it. We're seeking the honor and the glory of God in every situation, right? Not just, uh, you know, doing it our way. This is the way I think it needs to be done. We are seeking the, the glory of God, okay? So I'm at somebody's house. They give me something to eat. I'm not going to be like, well, I don't know. Is this, you know... <laughs> Is this a gluten-free? I mean, I don't know if you if you've got a gluten allergy. I'm not telling you to die for somebody, but you know, I'm not going to be just critical of what they've given me. They give me a glass of water. I'm like, oh man, that that glass is kind of nasty. Can you go wash that for me and be you know cause them to offend? All right, I'm not going to be like that. They put it before you, don't. If they put meat before you, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna eat it. All right, and so the reason you're doing that is because there's no reason to. To be offensive. Now, in this situation, again, I want to preach on this sometime and get more specific, but in this situation, what if somebody pre presents something to you and says, oh yeah, hey, this is a sacrifice to an idol or something like that, and they they bring up a situation, you know, where you have to take a stand and say, whoa, 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 I've, I can't eat that because I'm, I'm not. That's, that's a different situation, okay? Now, let me ask you about this question. There are some times 
we have not been so submissive at somebody's door, okay? For instance, no soliciting on the door, right? That creates a situation that causes some Christians to say, hey, it says no soliciting, therefore we need to be respectful of them and not knock on their door. Well, here's the thing. I want to preach the gospel to every creature. That's our goal. That's what we're supposed to do, right? That's obeying God. Now, at the same time, if I knock on their door and they say, hey, can't you read? It says no soliciting. Get lost. Yes, sir. I'm out of here, right? Because there's no reason to sit there and argue with them. I used to do that. I used to be like, well, actually, I'm not soliciting. By definition, like, who cares? They're telling you to get lost. Get lost. If they say, hey, don't bang so loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, next time I'll remember, whatever. You know, hey, don't walk on the grass. Like, there's no reason you're at someone else's house and be like, don't you know who you're talking to? I'm a man of God. No, you're at their house. Be submissive to them, okay? What about mask required? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, yesterday, Jeff, Brother Jeff and I are knocking on doors, and there is a door that said mask required. Actually, it said mask required beyond this point. I didn't have a mask on me, okay? I... I I probably wouldn't, yeah, I probably wouldn't have had, I mean, I wouldn't deliberately take one, but I have said many times, I probably should start carrying one in my pocket because if it opened up a door where the person said, Hey, I can't talk to you if you don't have a mask on. And I'm so caught up on, well, I'm not going to wear a mask that I would let somebody die and go to hell. That's a problem, <laughs> right? So I probably should be willing to have one on me. In this case, I didn't have one on me. I knocked on the door and when she came with the mask on, I stepped way back and I said, I don't have a mask, but I won't come any closer than this. I just want to talk to you. We ended up having a great conversation. Turned out she was saved and she was working with two not over 90 year old people that were in that house and she was taking care of them. And for obviously or obvious reasons, she wanted to keep them safe. If I would have just went all oh, their offensive, arguing about the mask situation and talking about how, would that have helped anybody? <laughs> no. Right? So you understand this whole principle of being submissive one to another just means we're trying to honor God by preferring one another over ourselves and not to, uh, not to cause offense. Okay? Uh, again, when we're soul winning and a silent partner is talking, just let them talk. Let them decide uh, what to do. Uh, this is something that I think we all have, have talked about many times and understand that. Look at Matthew 19, 30. Matthew 19, 30. Actually start with verse 27. Another thing we want to be careful to do that is kind of fitting in this situation is not be that kind of person that is just always looking for the best seat, you know, the best parking place, closest seats. You know, man, I, I when we used to go to camp, now we had reasons for having to uh, uh, reserve our seats and everything. But I remember it just grated on my nerves that everybody would like rush there to get as early as they can so they could put the reserve signs on their front seat, right? The very best seats. And I was like, man, I don't want to be that kind of guy. So sometimes uh, I would end up not doing that and then we would get bad seats or it's hard to find seats together or something. And, and anyway, I'm, I'm not trying to go overboard on that, but I'm just saying I, I hate that mentality of, whoa, whoa, look, there's a parking spot. It's closer. We got to get that parking spot. You know, one time I was pulling into a bank and, uh, and I started to pull just because it was convenient, not necessarily because it was close, but it was convenient. And I started to pull into uh, a parking spot that was like right there by the door, super close. And this is crazy, but it's like the Holy Ghost was like convicting my heart and saying, you have no reason to take that close of a parking spot. What if somebody else needs that parking spot? And so I went and I parked somewhere. It was a little inconvenient, but I parked like, you know, a little bit ways away. And I took that parking spot and I was like, well, that's... Probably I'm going to come out and nobody will still be at that parking spot. No big deal. But, you know, before I even went inside the, uh, the door, this old lady, probably 90 years old, pulls up in her car and she takes that parking spot. And I watch her as she gets out and she's feeble and she's struggling and all that. And I thought, see how f selfish that would have been of me to be like, ooh, the best place. I want the biggest, I mean, I want the, the best seat in the house. I want the closest parking spot. 
if we're not careful in our flesh, that's us. It's all about us, what we want, how we please ourselves. But we really need to be submissive to other people and to prefer one another. And so here's what it says in Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter, now granted, and I think about it, these, the disciples were like, hey, in the kingdom, can I sit by your right hand and by your left? I mean, constantly like wanting the best seat, wanting to sit next to, hey, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? And uh, asking all these things. Peter said unto him, behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Verse 30 says, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So many times we just go through our whole life with this competitive idea. I got to be first. I got to win. I got to be the, the, the best. I got I to gotta have the most, uh, you know. I, I don't think anyone's like this, but you know, we could even fall into that trap with soul winning. Man, I haven't had a soul one for a little while. People are going to start thinking I'm not a good soul winner, so I better do something. You know, I got to get. Look, it's it's good to have motivation and encouragement to go out and knocking doors and get somebody saved. But look, it's not even whenever we go door knocking, it's not about you. It's not about hey, this is the way we got to do it. This is the way you know so and so does it or whatever. It's not about you. It's about obeying the Lord, submitting yourself one to another. Uh, uh, preferring one another, glorifying God in all that you do. God knows what you need. He's going to, he's going to, if you're wanting to serve him, uh, he's going to make sure that you get an opportunity to do that. And he's going to bless that. But you've got to be willing to humble yourself and prefer over others over yourself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, no matter how long we've been Christians and, and uh, where we are in our Christian life, this is something that all of us have to deal with. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us just never get to the point where uh, we start forgetting about the needs of others and start making it all about ourselves, even when it comes to laws and ordinances that we don't want to follow. I pray that you'll help us to have the right view on it. And uh, if we have got to choose to disobey a rule, Lord, help it be for the right reasons and, uh, and help us do it with the right spirit so that we wouldn't cause offense. Uh, to anybody that we're trying to witness to, uh, we would be able to leave the door open to be able to come back and uh, have a good testimony with them, or uh, or even even folks that that we come across that are saved. Lord, help us be an encouragement to them that they might maybe become laborers and even be able to be motivated to get out there and do more for you. Help us just to be constantly mindful of uh, of your your will and what you would have us to do and to be sensitive to the leadership of your spirit. Help us clean our own lives of pride and, and lust and sins that might be in our life that would hinder us from walking in the spirit and understanding uh, what it means to, uh, to prefer one another and to be submissive one to another. I pray you be honored and glorified now in Jesus' name. Amen.